I think that there's a lot of effort, culturally speaking, in the Western world to generate all of this sensitivity that makes everybody weaker and more divided. Much easier to govern badly. I think that's all quite clearly planned. COVID is a brilliant example, isn't it? We happily gave up democratic rights and established precedents. And it was achieved through fear-mongering, division, through demonizing people that were being good citizens. You can't do that. You can't lock down a society just because there are extreme ideas that you understand because you see nuance. You can lose everything for that. That's deliberate. But what I'm most bothered about in this time, people that have concerns with unmanageable immigration and that are worried about their cultural values and not being able to survive it. This is the same thing immigrant families worry about. You're accused of being racist, homophobic, sexist, things that you're not. People complaining about too much immigration are far-right Nazis. No, no, they're not. Like, this is just life experience. Sorry if you don't have it. It's entirely natural to have some xenophobia. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, how do you deal with that? Because it's not a nice feeling. A brilliant way of dealing with that is learning some of the language. I've become intimately familiar with your voice. As you know, I live in Mexico City, been here for a few years, been struggling to uh, to learn the language here and tried all the conventional approaches. I had a private tutor. I tried the conventional apps. Um, I tried classes. Nothing seemed to be working. I went on Reddit late one night, just out of frustration. Somebody mentioned this thing called language transfer. I saw that it was things that happen already. <laughs> I saw that it was free. So I didn't have a lot of faith in it because it was free, oddly enough. But I downloaded it and uh, was completely blown away by what I experienced and, and the effectiveness of this, this approach. And I became obsessed and I went through the course a couple of times. I was able to now finally communicate in uh in spanish and um and i've been wanting to have you on the podcast ever since because i know that whenever you find something like that something that has such uh it's, it's so accessible and so effective those two things don't usually go together right it's either inaccessible or really expensive and effective or it's ineffective and it's accessible, but to have something that is accessible and effective at the same time is like Haley's Comet. And so um, so I, I knew that there was some sort of backstory to you and to this development of this app. And I and when when we when we when I reached out to you and you agreed to come on, I I, I did the deeper research. And of course, um, you know, you you have a very non-traditional uh backstory and I, and so I want to start with with the backstory so people can really appreciate your perspective. Uh, I know you grew up in East London. Talk a little bit about that. What was that like? what what was the vibe like in your household that sort of shaped where your life was going? Oh, I think a lot about that as I get older because I think as you get older you understand more what's not normal so to speak what's specific about how how you grow up you no know? so I, I think forevermore just about and it also seems so magical and mystical somehow when you think back like so many lives ago right because you had such a different state of consciousness so in regards to like where i grew up i appreciate smaller things now about even like where you said london and i was like and i was thinking well London or Essex, no one really knows where it is because it's London Borough of Redbridge in Essex, which is a different county, but like London grew in the 60s. So your envelope, it says Essex, but you're in a London Borough. So even, even on that level of where the hell were we in England, <laughs> there was some confusion. And then when you layer that on the more obvious stuff of, that I've, of course, already thought about, which is, you know, that I grew up in a very like in an immigrant neighborhood, right? So 
it was much more multicultural than cosmopolitan. No, we're talking about first, second and third generation immigration. Um, very, very mixed up. Uh, that was a that was a fascinating realm to grow up in, and and even though I was used to hearing Greek and English at home, I think I think that's something you filter out as a kid. I remember hearing like Indian and, and Pakistani languages, and and that was when I was just like wow. And and I, I, I images that stick in my mind from growing up is I don't know things like going into the the post office and the couple where one would be doing the post and the other one would be on the till and they would like shout at each other in, in a language that sounded like so alien and then they would address you in a perfect queen's english and that switch uh i i always just found it so amazing when i was a kid and when i saw my parents speak greek in family context as well but yeah, just seeing, just just growing up around that, that's a pretty amazing thing for a developing mind to grow up around, you know? Mm -hmm. What kind of student were you? A terrible one. Well, uh, primary school, high school, when? Yeah, yeah, like just growing up, like primary school. I mean, I was always, all my reports said the same, which is he's super intelligent if he could concentrate on, you know? <laughs> Um, but for me, school was one day it was a social event. The other day I'd be like writing a story and nobody could distract me. And I'd be like all day hours writing. And the other day I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to talk today. And I was deciding that. <laughs> so, but you know, students always had like a special kind of tolerance for me when I look back. That's something else I understand as I get older. Just like, wow. Wow. A lot of teachers were really, really tolerant with me, weren't they? And I think that they noticed I had something special, to, so to speak. You know, I had something going on. I had a special kind of sensibility and they put up with a lot. And even in my high school, the fact that I didn't get expelled, I got suspended so many times, but I never got expelled. Like they didn't want to expel me from this school. That was conscious. That was mm -hmm. a conscious decision. <laughs> so yeah, I had a lot of behavioral problems in part just because of the way the system is. And in part because I had all of this, um, traumatic stuff going on at home that I was uh you know it was causing all kinds of psychological problems that that play out in other ways so yeah I was definitely a handful how did it show up though uh because I know later you you got really deep into activism um were you were you speaking out against teachers were you talking back were you picking fights like what, what were you what were you doing that was getting you that should have gotten you expelled well, ah, the expel stuff is a little bit, but I mean, to, to the disruptive stuff I was doing was actually just asking questions. So I would, I would start asking questions. I'd really want to understand photosynthesis, you know, uh -huh. or whatever it was that we were learning. And I would have very like genuine questions. And the first question you get answered and the second question you're disrupting, which is true, I guess. Like I get it. You've got 30 kids there. You're trying to keep on a track. So that's a systemic problem. It would be, uh -huh. it would be nicer if you could take advantage of, students curiosity to direct the curriculum you know and also maybe inform your curriculum like oh if students ask this here maybe that's what we need to teach at the same time we teach but you know there's there's none of that it's half babysitting half indoctrination and maybe a percent of education in <laughs> stealing from both halves <laughs> do, um, do you remember any specifics of something that you asked that they kind of gave you an unsatisfied it was, it was the beginning of every year it was the beginning of every year i started like you know laminating all my textbooks and the perfect uniform and being really excited and then i felt like i was always shut down quickly and then i would get disruptive so like, i can remember very specific things about terribly naughty things i did and um, but like i say it's not just about that there's always this mix over with the repression you're experiencing at home and stuff you want to talk about and you've been taught to not talk about it so that comes so you know i have a memory like <laughs> i think of this teacher i'm gonna name her mrs crabtree that she was she must have just been so so stressed this poor being that like i actually set the science lab on fire and she just continued lecturing whilst everybody was screaming like she didn't <laughs> you know, and a, a, a teacher passing by running with a fire extinguisher and i did that by like crawling under you know we used to have these benches with sinks in them and we were doing the thing where we were taking the color out of the leaf with alcohol. And I was like, oh, this is a brilliant idea. So I just crawled around the class, 
unscrewed all of the plumbing and set it on fire because I just had that dissonance in me, didn't I? And uh, so I was I was playing out for a whole bunch of stuff, and then. And by the end of high school, I was just going from one class to the other, waiting outside the class. Like I wasn't allowed in. I just had mm. to wait outside the class and, and bounce around. And then all my predicted grades were like E's and F's and U's, which means like unmarked. And then I, 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 I didn't know what GCSEs were. It was something I heard around. Those were the exams you took back then. I didn't know what it meant. I was worried about other things. Uh, mm. I was already working when I was 15, uh, you know, and then I was like, Oh, what you mean? GCSEs are exams that I'm going to be working at McDonald's forever if I fail them. Oh shit! And then I just I got very serious. I made myself a revision schedule. I did like six to eight hours a day, and I got one A, six Bs, and two Cs, which nobody could believe. Nobody could believe it. And there were, I had some very unsupportive teachers, and I was really cocky. So on the results day, I'll never forget that I went up to the the one that was constantly writing letters to my mother to tell her how bad I was. And I did think it was his fault because this was my RE teacher and religious education. And he put, when we have to, we have to choose our subjects when we go into GCSEs. And I chose RE because he's like, we're going to debate. We're going to talk about life. And we, we did zero debate. We were just getting lectured by this guy. So I was like, no, this is your fault. You put on the, on the, on the thing that we were going to debate, you know? And I, 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 sh I, sh I probably shouldn't be sharing this, but I like, I, I went up like with my results like that in front of him and just went, ah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and no one, no one, no one thought, yeah, because he literally was writing letters to my mum saying he's gonna, he's not gonna pass one exam and blah blah blah. And I'm gonna, I said to my mum, you're gonna see it's his fault. You're gonna see it's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing in your free time back then? Yeah um well i was working already so that was a big thing for me back then well at, i mean the, the later later parts of school um we had three periods so i remember we'd be hanging out a lot with friends i'm, I'm gonna see again now i've not seen in some of them in 20 years now and back in the uk and uh, we'd be talking about life as if we were grown-ups and uh yeah I, I at that age i didn't i didn't have like free time activities I was, I mean, either at school or sat in my bedroom <laughs> or working. Right. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. Okay. So eventually you go to university because you'd watch some what Ali McBeal and learned about law and thought you wanted to become a lawyer potentially. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, I wanted to go to uni to just, it was the way to move out of home that I understood. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and because I, I was getting better grades than what was ever expected of me, and that, that was good for me psychologically, right? Like teachers were egging me on. I was this really naughty kid that was like the, you know, the naughty genius and whatever, and they loved it. And um, so it made me choose law because law was one of the hardest things to get into. So with A-levels, you know, I never thought I was going to get A's and B's, right? And uh, so I was like, let's do what I can do with that, which you need A's to get into law, you know? So and 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 like you said i um my entire exposure to the world was channel four in the uk so uh yeah like i was watching ali McBeal and uh making this internal world in my head that this is what living like a lawyer could be like and you know i just had like a extreme cultural poverty and ignorance as a kid that i really enjoyed talking about like i'm not ashamed of it i think it's funny um but yeah yeah totally like these were the these were the kind of things informing my my life decisions. And when I changed to languages, I really wanted to learn Japanese just because of Tarantino movies that made it cool. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's that's I, I like actually really explaining that's because you know I'm a very knowledgeable person now, and I and I've and I've really sought knowledge and sought truth, and I kind of enjoyed like helping people understand just how can I say basic bitch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
not in my soul, so to speak, so to speak, right? But in in regards to my outlook on the world, so so basic. Did you find that you were being engaged more in university than you were in um, high school, and or because at some point you you dropped out of law school and you started to study languages? So I'm just mm. curious what that what was the motivation behind that. I it, well, it, I I found already depressing. I I I feel like I had to. I wanted to go out into the world with with a love, a deep love for the world, mm -hmm. and law was the one. Law, like you know, now I find it much more interesting. But at the time, I want to learn about the world. I want to learn things that make me love the world. I don't want to just sit around reading about like judgments of old men about stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah now it's massively meaningful now that i understand so much more about the balance of democracy and government and power and authority and all of that stuff but at the time i needed to find a way to fall in love with the world and it wasn't going to be law that was clear um i enjoyed practicing like when we did mooting fake law trials and stuff i'd always win but i didn't enjoy the reading and all of that um, so it was an international university. There were people from all over the world. I think it, I, I think I was very depressed at uni as well. I was extremely disappointed with everything in the first year. And I think that maybe allowed me to lean more into this Cypriot side of me maybe. So, uh, it, I, you know, it's hard for me to talk lately without talking about dissociation because I've really learned like what a dissociated mind I have and how I have different islands that have developed independently in my mind and it's been a way to escape certain things I, I couldn't deal with and, and couldn't process. So if I look at that switch from law to languages, I see that, okay, there was definitely like a leaning into a bit different part of my identity, which I had completely blocked out, which was anything like Mediterranean about me. I was, that was very like kind of blocked out for me. And even in my name, like I changed my name when I was 16 and, and my surname wasn't a Greek one. And, um, and I think languages, made me go on to the other island i was very depressed in my first year at university i'd say that even like over the christmas holiday that i was on campus by myself and didn't think it through that i would be there by myself for a month in the cold and there'd be nobody like i'd say i was suicidal like i was really bad and i had no resource to manage it so i got very very depressed doing law um i was hiding all of that and whatever i passed law but in that process like towards the end of the year i was like okay i want to change degrees and i ended up choosing languages and it was just like a euphoric dissociation where i just cut the past year and everything else and i was like a new version of myself and it worked i was like a static i was a static i felt like i was in like harry potter school you know like learning something magical and then then i continued um I would say through that, like developing different of these different dissociative islands of myself through these languages. And actually now that I've just come back to UK on Thursday, I feel like I'm emerging from like a 15, 20 year dissociative tunnel, which I've been fighting my way out of the last few years um, as I began to understand this uh, psychological panorama that I have. So I'm in a fascinating time in my life right now where I'm just like coming out the end of this tunnel and being able to observe all of the experiences I had. But I never did it as like Michael, who I was growing up in the UK with that identity to defend. It was always like deleting everything that happened until now and reinventing myself from now. So I never had anything to defend, any norms or identities to defend when I was out there living new lives. And now I'm, I'm like oh my god that's a I, that's amazing i i start i begin to understand now how unique that experience and that perspective is so now i'm focusing on what the psychologists would be calling integration which would be <laughs> pulling in all these parts of me so i stop bouncing between these islands when life triggers me in certain ways and i and i face it and see okay what what is broken that's causing so much pain that's making me dissociate because i've been doing this for for years without really even realizing it this yeah well it started it started in childhood right um 
yeah like i i I wasn't aware of it i still don't understand exactly all of it because the whole point of it is to amnesiate trauma so there's there's all this stuff that i always knew happened my whole life and i and i dealt with and got on with it and now there's all of this stuff that has my jaw dropping and so i start getting flashbacks when i'm older and i'm really not sure if it even can be real and all kinds of stuff i start to understand the dissociation more and the dissociative episodes i had when i was a kid like where i remember being like oh god i'm not here what happened what happened what happened i'm still kind of putting the pieces together it's a bit forensic i don't want to obsess over it like trying to figure out what exactly happened i don't think i think there was so much that i would never possibly be able to remember everything Mm -hmm. it's just understanding what it did to my brain and how it's quite sad to realize now how not alive i've been in during so long because when you go into these really difficult periods or triggered periods and part of your nervous system shuts down it's like you're living but you're not really alive you're not really present and i've been really fighting to to not check out of life you know so all throughout like going up and down being euphoric being depressed and all of this you know i've always kept up with everything you know i've done my work espresso have an espresso get to it get what they do but it's been so so hard and so painful and not like the mental tension it's created in me has been triggering i've just been very trapped in myself and in the bad feeling in my body in my nervous system and so i've been checking out like i've not been a hundred percent present and now that i've been fighting so hard to 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 be present and to not be hiding from things in my mind I'm I'm forever more alive and it's really beautiful but kind of sad at the same time but I'm not the kind of person that goes like oh I've missed out on so much because it's like I clearly needed this learning journey like mm-hmm. it takes me till I'm 39 to to start living properly properly you know more present so to speak and all of that um I'm not footing the journey you know but Anyway, it's a lot of very interesting stuff that, that the languages and language transfers had a huge overlap with in my life, whether I've realized it or not. And now I see it's so important for everybody because the more I understand about dissociation, different types of dissociation and the way the mind deals with trauma that it can't process. And a lot of that trauma is like collective, you know, political or social. Um, the way it dissociates, and and we get programs or parts of us that don't develop into other parts of us coherently, integrally. They 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 get activated or triggered and they take over. And you know, everybody, I think everybody knows somebody that does something bad and then says, I never did that. And they believe it. But they believe it. That's a brilliant example of dissociation. And it's something we need to understand especially as we become more spiritually damaged as a society, it's something we really, really need to begin getting our heads around so we can understand the root of what we might call evil. Mm -hmm. Because in many cases, it's that ability to dissociate and not be the person that's instrumentalizing the body that allows people to do stuff that is so absurd and incomprehensible for others. And... You know, I look at extreme cases of, you know, things that I can't comprehend, violence I can't comprehend. And I think about it in terms of dissociation and it becomes so much more comprehensible. You know, from the most minor things to very, very serious stuff. So I, in somehow in the context of language transfer, I want to address this at some point. Like, I don't know how. I don't know if I'm going to make a psychology course or a... Uh, introduction to your nervous system or what have you you know but there's there's something ticking there in the background for me with all of this well okay so that's that's we'll we'll call that the dark side of disassociation right i've i've seen interviews with like very accomplished people who suffered or experienced dyslexia growing up and you know that at the time was so difficult for them and they had to work 10 times as hard as everyone else to pass their exams and excel and all of this. But they all said that it also benefited them in, 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 in inspiring them to come up with creative solutions for 
um, navigating the world. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, since you've been dealing with this since you were a child, how has disassociating benefited you, particularly when you first started teaching? You started teaching Spanish, then you started teaching tango. And you started teaching Spanish almost as a prodigy, someone who learned it so quickly. And you, I'm assuming you learned it in the conventional way, but there's something about the way you process that that allowed you to start teaching it in a very effective manner to other people. Was there something about this background that helped you to do I that? I think only, only in regards to obsession. So like you don't, you don't have dissociative symptoms well, some people do but you don't have dissociative symptoms your whole life it's just kind of when they need to jump in and save you so i've had periods where i've been like quite sure who i was but i've always been because when you dissociate you don't know like i only figured this out like a few years ago when i when like argentina locked down and i couldn't load properly and i was like something isn't right here <laughs> you know uh because i'd gone there like 8th of march and 10th of march it like everything was shut and and i couldn't load that version of myself um, in regards to like, I, I was I was very desperate to, or I believe my subconscious was desperate to develop in a way that it hadn't. So I never, I know I felt quite a lot of rejection towards the world when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't feel part of. I always felt like an anomaly, um, and ah, oh, there's many complicated reasons for why that might be. But in in Spanish, I believe my brain was looking for that assimilation. So I was like extremely for so that's one part the other part is there are security issues like if you're living in latin america especially 20 years ago you don't want to look like a foreigner so there's that one part of like safety there is the other part of i was you know really like i went to argentina and said i was born here yesterday so my brain obsessed over i mean like all day every day i'm on the bus uh, every single every single word and sign i'm going past I'm hacking it to pieces and and working out rules I've not read anywhere, you know. Um, so that side of it definitely, like, I think that what, what I managed, the, 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 the high bar I've reached with language transfer has definitely got a lot to do with my own obsession and my own need to, to be native in a new language, so to speak. Not fluent, native. Like, I wanted to be a native speaker. Was that obsession a result of you being able to effectively, I'm going to use this word, maybe it's correct, maybe it's not, but effectively disassociate from whatever else was happening? So in other words, you could just focus or hyper-focus or like you said, become obsessed with- uh, no, I think that's- And not look, get distracted. Dissociation is a very common part of human psychological experience. I hope you're not the same with your lover as you are with your mother, right? That's a dissociation. <laughs> Right, uh, a, a dissociative problem, so to speak, or a, or a disorder, which in my case, like I look at my own personal case, I'm like, I'm not even comfortable calling this a disorder. This is putting order to the disorder outside. But anyway, a disorder would be when your body is using, your mind is using that mechanism for survival and stuff goes wrong. No. So I, I wouldn't consider this or everything a dissociation and also i want to say as we're talking about dissociation if people look up dissociation dissociative identity disorder it's going to be very very hard to not find over therapized youth which are being over therapized into bringing their internal world a little bit too far out so you'll have people on videos talking about how they're mermaids and, and what have you I don't want to judge too much there. I do believe they're over therapized, but I also want to say that's not the bandwagon I'm getting on. These are all versions of myself that were frozen in time and they've always been there living in my nervous system. I used to talk about it. I just didn't know there was anything weird about it. So I would say for, you know, all the time in my early twenties that this 14, 15 year old Michael keeps looking at me when I'm learning Spanish, this Essex boy going, you sound well foreign. Do you know what I mean? Like, and and it and I, I never thought anything of it. I never thought anything of it. But uh, with more investigation and noticing how I have certain triggers and uh, the, the things I go through and whatever, I and uh, I really and not with meditations and and other like uh, natural medicines and stuff, I've really been able to see quite clearly 
and it's very typical all of the research i've done psychologically it's extremely typical what has happened to me that there are certain parts of me that just simply did not develop they stopped developing something happened it was it was unprocessable and they stopped developing and they they continue in an eternal world and it's absolutely madness but it's it, explains the bad sleep and the dreams i've always had like when i dream i feel like there's a battle of consciousnesses uh it, it explains so so much about just how difficult every day life has been for so long and i find it so fascinating because there are spiritual questions there like if you can have various developing or subdeveloped or whatever personalities in you what the hell are we and you know like psychological physiological studies have shown that people's different dissociations have different physiological s symptoms like you can have somebody that needs glasses and someone that doesn't living in the same body like that's mad that it's it's absolutely fascinating and as i am somebody that like all of my investigation in life seems to end up feeding back into that one big question of what are we what are we doing here this is a fascinating subject for me that i think i'm going to be able to produce a lot from you know, and I don't want to do it in the typical way that people talk about mental health. I think that might be clear already. It's easy to to fall into that. Um, but yeah, I, I think mental health is something that everybody needs to be well versed in because we don't live in especially healthy societies. It's not just like a few neuroatypical people that, you know, no, we're all a little bit like this right and the more you know about autism and adhd and dissociation and all of this the more you will see it in yourself and in people around you you know mm -hmm. okay so and then back in those early days when you were first teaching spanish and then tango what, what what translated between language and dance when it came to how people learn so like i said i didn't realize i was doing something similar um with those two things but you know, because I think what you'd seen though was the post I made a while ago when I was like, oh, I realized I was doing thinking method with Tango. Mm -hmm. And that was because I was always so focused on thinking about the part of the body that moves, so obvious a thing to say, rather than the part of the body that looks good, which in Tango is so important because there's so much like whip action. So, you know, when you see somebody like swing their leg back in Tango, you get that lovely whip action, not because they're thinking about the bit that makes the whip action. That looks so clumsy. It's painful. Like, it literally looks painful. If somebody's thinking about their ankle when they do that, it's painful to watch. It's embarrassing. Sorry, I am quite aesthetically concerned as a person. But if you think about your thigh and you swing it back and you let the whip action happen, then you make a beautiful gancho hook, it's called no so from the stretches at the beginning of the class to all the way through i was so focused on the bit that you were moving which people that grow up dancing and then decide to start teaching they don't focus on that they focus on what it looks like and they're showing you you know and in spanish enseñar it means to teach and to show which is a quite quite a good hint there about how badly we've been teaching that's how cats teach their young that's how dogs teach their puppies they show them because they can't explain stuff but we're humans now <laughs> so rather than just showing like this is what it has to look like we need to take that extra conscious step and just with that small thing you know i had people like i was fast tracking people i was getting people to the milonga which is where you go to dance tango publicly like with minimal lessons and getting them learning on the go and they look like people that had been learning for a year or two and they've been going for like a month you know how though would you tell them don't think about it or would you would no you... i'd be instructing them constantly about thinking about the part of the body that moves rather mm -hmm. than trying to imitate visually that's it basically so you know just every lesson we'd have a dance we'd have a stretch even with stretching you're thinking about Pull, you're not just stretch, like stretch your arm no focus on your shoulder open it up focus on your elbow open it up focus on your wrist open it up step by step uh, you grow a few inches <laughs> uh and you know even just starting there you're f focusing on the part of the body you're moving so at the same time when you s take a step in tango and you know tango is not like other dances because when you see a tango dance it's not necessarily choreographed right someone's like they're kicking between each other's legs but that can be um 
how do you say improvised because as you dance your the 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 lead role which is generally the male no is leading to the other dancer what they're going to do so as a dancer you're not just thinking about yourself you're either giving a lead and planning always one step ahead or receiving a lead and always waiting for that information before taking a step no so there's this whole community give element in tango as well which isn't as important in other dances even in salsa when you dance somebody you're literally just like spinning them around and throwing them around and like relying on ricochet <laughs> ricochet forces and all of that but tango is what i say is the dance that's least like a dance it's somewhere between acro acrobacy and martial arts yeah and you, you talk a lot about in the spanish course that i did on language transfer and by the way you've done i think 10 courses uh, everything from french to swahili to greek italian arabic turkish etc 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 and the courses are all structured kind of like you're listening in on a private course where you're taking a person through the principles you talk a lot you hone in on principles and then you 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 are you are good about making sure that the student is not is not answering the prompts from memory but rather they're they're applying the principles that you're teaching and the whole idea is if you if you apply the principles you can pretty much work out um whatever the whatever you need to say next in that particular language so would you say that that is sort of a, a commonality between what you were teaching in tango and what you now teach through language transfer yeah i mean to a degree, I mean, because the focus on language courses is translating thought, not language. We're very focused on translating thought rather than words, which mm -hmm. is easily missed because I'm so focused on the way English works. But I'm so focused on the way English works or whatever the base language is to demonstrate to you how your mind is already translating thought into language even in your native language that's something that's already happening you don't think in language although you can think in language of course you can use language to think and debate with yourself it's not necessary for thought you actually translate thought into language so that's what we do when we learn a second language as well you know so that's it's like to give you a really simple example if if you want to say do you want and you're stuck on do looking for the word for do to translate that into spanish you're not going to find it because that's not how you make a question in spanish you don't use a word you just use your tone of your voice so that's a very obvious example of where you need to be focused on the information you're communicating not the words otherwise you'll be all day looking for do no mm -hmm. uh so that's that's quite a heavy focus um which i guess there's some parallel there you can draw with thinking about the part of your body that's moving no but um you know the thinking method i would say is a very flexible method depending on the language and on the subject no which is why i love taking it to something like swahili because everybody's like you know I, i've got this the thinking method is finding cognates and it's like no it's not because i can't teach swahili if it's about finding cognates you don't have normal normal legal legal in Swahili, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that we use the cognates is just one part, it's just one principle manifesting itself, which would be maybe we don't reinvent the wheel as a principle. So having this vocabulary, we're gonna use it, but it's also so brilliant to, to teach other skills. For example, the very important skill of translating ideas rather than words so i like to play with you know sentences like how would you say i want to get involved okay you don't know how to say get involved but you can find an asian word which are words we learn to convert to mean the same so the idea is to find, yeah participation participation so that there i'm using the cognates to get to the the aim of teaching the skill set which is you unpeeling yourself from the word which is really the best word i can use there unpeeling yourself from the word you're looking for and remembering the meaning you're looking for and then you can maybe find various words that express that meaning and that's a that's that's a shortcut to fluency no mm -hmm. um, so i might you know want your advice but i don't know your advice i don't know advice i don't know how to say consejo in spanish <laughs> so maybe i would ask for your recomendacion that's a manifestation of different um the values within the method 
the cognates in themselves are not the method. So in the Swahili course, uh, we start by looking at onomatopoeia, right? So that's words that have a sound like like the sound they generate, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't know, like to brush might be onomatopoeia because it like brush is kind of, the sound of brush is kind of like the sound you make when you do that. So, mm -hmm. you know, to learn Swahili, we don't have cognates, but we, we have words that are similar because they come from onomatopoeia and the point there is that we're not focused on memorizing the word but the structure so when we when we learn swahili you know we can learn two verbs infinitive verbs like kulala kucheka ku is the two lala is like lullaby so it's to sleep and then cheka is like chaku so it's to laugh kucheka and that is the onomatopoeia of check <laughs> Um, so yeah, it, it, it's the the method really does bend around um, the subject. It's ironically named, like I said, the thinking method. It was meant to be a joke. Like, did you notice they're not teaching you to think? <laughs> but it's so normalised that like no one's really got on the joke. But it's always just about like there is a new truth to be had in any subject as long as you're thinking in a way that you're trying to generate maximum coherence between any ideas that pertain to the same area rather than trying to maintain the truth of ideas that have come before. So like one of the most shocking things for me when I started to write was the fact that I couldn't trust any of the grammar books I was reading. Like I was reading the top publications um, about certain languages, the go-to publications, and I started to realize, so the negative language transfer the, lang the other languages the writer spoke that made them jump to conclusions about the language they were writing about. So it was common in Italy, for example, you know, like Westerners that speak French and whatever, writing about Swahili, and you can see how their understanding of French influenced that. And I could pick that up, and I'm like going to the front of the book to see the name. All oh, right, they're French speaker, that makes sense. You know, so this whole journey also was very, very fascinating for me in regards to what is truth. And now I don't, I don't trust the truth behind anything. I want to investigate it myself. I don't feel like I want to repeat any information that I don't understand intimately, if that mm. makes sense, you know? So that really changed my perspective in a much more general way. And I think the thinking method is the ideal method, not just to teach, but to think about your subject. All subjects have these brick walls they come up to, physics, where everything breaks down, you know? All these rules work until we, oh, no, but until we get to that extreme and it all breaks down. And I think the thinking method is perfect to go and right back to the beginning and say, we want truths that make each other more true and, and, and see where that goes. So uh, I made the music course because I want to open the the panorama of the thinking method it's not just about languages you know so i I'm, i have the the platform online where i'm inviting new writers serious writers to come and try their hand at um course writing and i'm you know i have the guidebook and other infrastructure i'm creating to make that easier for people and i would love for people to come and make new language courses but also new courses like physics chemistry uh the world gets amazing when you start looking at it in that way and i think the, the music course demonstrated that really well i think it's it was an experimental course it's by no means perfect i kind of apologize that for that on the first track that it's experimental but i'm so excited about the angle that we that we went into music and 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 what that achieves just to give the listener a little more context can we talk can we talk more about the inception of language transfer in terms of, you know, how did you get proof of concept that, I mean, obviously you've been teaching in person, but now you were going to be teaching over a recording and, um, and then how activism played a role in this endeavor, because you, you, you got to a point, you had some experiences perhaps in Cyprus where you started to see language learning as a form of activism. All right. The project itself was, um, you know, so I'd, I'd become like a native Argentine, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I, 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 there was a, just a point where I had a, I had like, I would call it a kind of dissociative break again, where I was just like, okay, Spanish speaking world, we're so done. Uh, 
this is my parting gift. So the first, the first and the only course I was going to make was English for Spanish speakers. And, you know, at the same time, I'd always done, since I was a teenager, I did activism without knowing what activism meant. That's always been quite natural to me when I feel like I see something's wrong to call it out. Um, I think that's also a big part of like British culture or it, it was, I don't know if it still is, but this kind of very like British indignation when something isn't as it should be and it's incorrect. Um, so there was always that activism element in regards to anything. Like if I feel like things should be taught like this, I want to correct it. So anyway, I was always doing this different kind of activism stuff and NGO work and all kinds of different stuff. I was very disappointed with the NGOs, seeing how that they spent money and realizing, okay, this is actually just kind of like an ego project of the founder. They're not really doing anything good with this money. I have a leaflet celebrating themselves. Oh, that's sad. I really wanted to lie to myself about it because I was coordinator of two projects and I was like 23 and had my own little business cards and I felt like the nuts. But luckily, uh, I can't handle that internal dissonance. Um, so I quit. And whilst all of that stuff was happening, you know, I was teaching these kind of scary girls that were kind of like the girls I was be scared of growing up at high school, like gelled hair, big hoop earrings, scary girls. And I was teaching these girls um, English in, in a call center. And they were like, you know, they were coming, smacking their gum with the worst attitude. And I was a bit intimidated by them. And really soon they just became so gentle. They would come running to the class with their folder in their hand, you know, and this was after work as well. And I saw a change in them. And there was one class, like they just started crying, just like, I can't believe, I can't believe what we're doing. And then I was like, oh, this can be my activism. I don't have to continue like smashing my head against other people's projects, trying to make them do things properly and earn the money that they're getting uh, and do my own thing. And that was when, so I was just going to do it for English, for Spanish speakers. And then I went to Cyprus, you know, leaning on, on that different, I, I really needed a reset, you know, so I was suddenly a Cypriot and, um, I decided I was going to go live in Cyprus. And then, of course, it fit perfectly in there because Cyprus is a divided island. It's been divided. The capital's been divided since 1964, the island since 1974. And we speak English uh, and, like, all over the island, people speak English. And then there's Greek uh, Cypriot in the south and Turkish Cypriot in the north. Um, two languages that, like have so much fascinating overlap that shows so much about our joint history um teaching them goes so it goes so well against the hatred we're indoctrinated with um uh you know most of us are brought up being taught to hate greeks or hate turks but at the same time you know it's very funny indoctrination the way it works because for one point you know you can tell a cypriot that we're that cypriots we're more similar to each other than we are to Greeks or Turks. And they'll say, I know, and in the next breath, I hate them anyway. Um, it's very strange. You know, we are culturally, genetically, some Swedes came and studied us to tell us, uh, we are the same. Also because like people changed religion for tax. We weren't Greek and Turkish Cypriots. We were Mohammedans and different types of Christians, Maronites, Orthodox. It was like English colonialism that came and uh, called us Greek and Turkish Cypriots. People know that. People know that, but they still can't. It's very hard to shed an identity based on victimhood because it means you can be angry and violent and it's always the other person's fault. So how was I going to go to Cyprus and, you know, bury language transfer? It, it was like, oh, okay, my thing is relevant again here, isn't it? So I, I continued with Greek and Turkish and Arabic um, and, and on it went. But like I say, the the plan, it was originally just going to be my parting gift to the Spanish speaking world. <laughs> I remember seeing a picture. I think it was on your Facebook page. You were at a like a folding table with a microphone outside in Cyprus. I think, yeah, not a microphone. I had my head, big headphones on. Maybe. Yeah. What, 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 what couldn't I have seen from looking at that picture that was going on around you at that time? But what was, give us some context to that. So that was at the beginning of the movement where we started to occupy the buffer zone and it was it was really difficult because we have a lot of 
spoiled children in Cyprus that identify as anarchists or Marxists or anti-fascists and whatever. And uh, they, they, they don't bring the best energy or attitude to a space. So it, at the beginning, there was like an internal battle for representation. So that's why I brought my work to do it there. You know, we are not just scruffy young people wanting to like drink and take drugs in the street. That there was a lot of that happening publicly in the buffer zone. That you know, like certain people with that they call anarchist views, and they should be able to do what they want. And it's just like, okay, but that's not what we're here to protest. <laughs> we need to, you know, we're here to make to bring Greek and Turkish Cypriots together here. And you're standing there with like, anyway. Um, so th what I was doing there on that table was editing, I believe, Greek 2, which were my original Greek courses that I deleted after doing the new Complete Greek. Um, and that, that's the crossing point. So that's where people come and show their ID to cross the buffer zone. Now, the buffer zone is officially run by the UN. And so it was, we were a UN problem when we went there. So it, it was a very interesting time, you know. Um, I kind of started the movement by accident. Uh, the UN was really untowards and uh, trying to deal with everything, trying to get us out in a kind of backhanded kind of way, you know, like threatening us through the illegal police of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, because that's not a state actually recognized by mm -hmm. the UN or the EU. The, the official stance is that Cyprus is a, island in the eu and the cypriot government the greek cypriot government is uh the government of the entire island but it doesn't exercise effective control over a part of it anyway that was a very complicated uh but that was that was what was all going on in the background but i did lose the fight to these um rather undeveloped souls that just turned the place into an absolute squat and were doing horrible things there uh so i i publicly announced my departure in february i actually got attacked i got physically attacked by one of them um and and then i think in april they got raided by terrorist police but i wasn't there by then i was in egypt um yeah but <laughs> it was a, it was it was a it was an interesting movement in in a lot of ways it was hard it was really really tough it was really tough um but it gave me a lot of experience about a certain type of people that I wouldn't really understand how important it was for many years later. Um, especially now where I feel like people like me have been entirely usurped by a popularized version of what the activist is, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of rhetoric that's coming from people that's supposed to be concerned with freedom and inclusion and all of that is achieving the polar opposite the polar opposite and 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 yeah i've had lots of experiences like along the way that makes me understand it really well and the complicated place we're in in the western world because because of that reason because you know what was before a niche that i kind of felt like i, I was inhabiting i was the only one that i knew in my life outside that was inhabiting that niche and that was concerned with certain questions that have now became ma become mainstream does that make sense? Yeah. Like the whole of society has been poured into this constant judgment about what's moral, what's correct, what you should support, what you shouldn't support, what you should say, what you shouldn't say. And I've been present for that since the seed was planted <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, when I was in high school to generate all of this sensitivity that makes everybody weaker and more divided. I think that's all quite clearly planned. Um, I think that there's a lot of effort, culturally speaking, in the Western world to make us all much better, much easier to govern badly. So I've been saying for a very long time, I've been talking about governable mentalities. And the word that I added to, for people to understand it, to communicate the idea better is badly. They want us to be easy to govern badly. Not just easy to govern, easy to govern badly, <laughs> you know? What does that mean badly? What give give us more context on? I think on... COVID is a brilliant example, isn't it? Um, I think that's where I think we were pretty badly governed there. Um, 
a, a, a problem or a risk, however exaggerated it was or wasn't, we happily gave up democratic rights and established precedents for it yeah. to happen. Uh, anytime you want and it was achieved through fear-mongering division through um demonizing people that were being good citizens and had questions about applying the rule of law no that sets a bad precedent you can't do that you can't lock down a society you can't set that precedent mm -hmm. etc etc et and uh so i think that's a perfect example of where we've been governed badly there's a million other examples but we are leaning always on the same thing, which is the, this is what you need to believe to be a good person, which we go back to the psychology. Psychological nervous system pain should not be underestimated. When you're rejected from your in-group, you're ostracized, when you're accused of being racist, homophobic, sexist, things that you're not, just because there are extreme ideas that you understand because you see nuance you understand that they're divisive and often quite racist or sexist in themselves in their effort to not be and you can lose everything for that that's mm -hmm. deliberate i don't believe we're that stupid not for one second that's deliberate and it's been you know I, I, and i've seen it all over the world in different phases and and argentina really had a head start with this with perinism if anyone wants to look into perinism that's like wokeism rewinded like 20 years or so um i mean perinism uh started i don't know 60s or whenever it was but the um, these cultural waves of of an extreme focus on on what's supposed to be morally correct and dehumanizing those that think differently Mm -hmm. uh, I saw that in Argentina with with the with, uh, I mean that's that's been going on elsewhere for a while <laughs> you know I, I think it's I think it's a very established uh, mechanism of governance that we need to wise up to hey really quickly if you like this content or if you don't like it let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of and then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. And in that sense, I, I would say, and these are my words, not yours, but language transfer is sort of like a Trojan horse, right? Because you talk about it as a form of activism, as a way of sort of bringing us back together culturally and helping us to understand that there are connections between our language, maybe the other person's language and and once and, and and without even you know it's not like it's not heavy handed in that way but it's just through through making this process of learning enjoyable right which incentivizes someone to take the next lesson and the next lesson because each lesson i know the spanish course is i think 90 lessons and they're all like 5 minutes to 9 minutes or something like that and so they're short enough to be able to do on a regular basis and they are and there's you you have markers for progress. Like you only have to answer maybe, you know, five prompts in each of those short lessons. And it makes you feel like, wow, I can really do this. And then it makes you want to go to the next lesson, which I, again, it's not like it's any other type of app that I've tried. And I'm sure, you know, these other apps, Duolingo or whatever, they're not thinking about, well, we sh this is to bring us together culturally, right? That's not really the intent behind it. But, but it's both for me, you know, like this, I, I accuse, I cause people a lot of dissonance because of course I want to bring us together culturally. Of course, I'm a, a xenophile rather than a xenophobe. Mm -hmm. But what I'm most bothered about in this time are people, like I say, getting accused of being racist when they're not. People that have concerns with unmanageable immigration and are worried about their cultural values not being able to survive it this is the same thing immigrant families worry about my entire life be it indian families pakistani families greek families egyptian families we talk about freshies we talk about too many freshies so mm. a freshie is somebody fresh off the boat right doesn't have anything of this culture assimilated that is something that we need to talk about because it's something that needs to be done well right and the reason i enjoy the gray spot that i'm in or even the trojan horse that i'm in is because somebody would have to be very stupid to call me racist you know and 
so I'm like, okay, I am that guy in the middle that says, you know, all of that division you're feeling right now, all of this tension between this racism and this anti-racism, it's not actually there. It's not actually there. The great majority of these people that have these concerns are not racist and they share their concerns with their Indian and their Pakistani and their Turkish and their Chinese neighbors. That's so important for me right now, you know? So I love the fact that language transfer is somewhat of a Trojan horse where I'm clearly teaching with an extreme love for the world and extreme love for cultural differences, but I'm going to surprise people in the end uh, if they hear me talk, for example, that no, I'm not just like another one of these people repeating what you typically expect them to repeat that, you know, people complaining about too much immigration are far right Nazis. No, no, they're not. <laughs> like, this is just life experience. Sorry if you don't have it, you know, <laughs> but they're not. Um, and yeah, that for me, that's as important at the moment as the teaching the languages and the killing the xenophobia that this yeah. division is generating because this division and the fact that you tell people they can't complain about these things without being racist that generates xen xenophobia where there otherwise wouldn't be so i i love being in this nuanced area i love being in this gray area i'm so over how angry and desperate and hysterical it makes some people that can't understand it uh i'm gonna keep at it you know well, that, that, that's how I would describe the difference in language transfer and these other apps is when I would do these other classes, even private classes, I would literally leave the class hating Spanish. I hated it because it had all these irregular verbs and these rules and it's like, I didn't understand it. And what you do is you give context and you say, well, actually these words, which you thought were Spanish or English, these are actually Arabic in origin. And then these words are the same word in English, but just pronounced a little bit differently, et cetera, et cetera. And it makes you fall in love with Spanish. And that's that's yeah. that's not insignificant to hate a language. Exactly. exactly, exactly. And at the same time, I have so many complaints about Spanish culture, and that's not racism. There's things I love about Spanish culture. It's so absurd what we're taught is racism. So yeah, like, I love to be this person. I think that my love for the world and for cultural difference is so clear. And at the mm -hmm. same time, like I really, guys, invite me for debates, write to news sh channels, please. I'm so sick of hearing people stupider than me debate these things. <laughs> like, I really want to debate this stuff because there's so much damage being done in generating sensitivities that shouldn't be there. And it makes people feel like they're experiencing racism when they're not. I'm not saying racism doesn't exist. It exists and it feels horrible. I get it sometimes, you know, but it's not what we're being taught. It's not all the sensitivities that we're being taught. So I really enjoy um, operating as much as I get abuse for it, you know, but I enjoy inhabiting this zone where I'm either called an idiot lefty or I'm called ultra white. I'm called both. And I think that's a brilliant demonstration of just how stupid everything's gotten. Yeah, and what's missing when you hear the arguments of someone who is a, a xenophobe is context. And I think that's what you provide is you do it in such an artistic, elegant way, providing context. People don't even realize they're, they're learning when they're learning. Because, you know, learning is associated with boredom, um, difficulty, like no one thinks about the concept of learning as easy and enjoyable. Expanding your sense of self, that's another mm -hmm. big point in translating thoughts and not words. And you know, that's clear also in the courses the way I speak, it's like you're making, also because like I say, I had no idea I had any kind of dissociative disorder, right? So I'm always going on about this new version. And it's true, it is true for everybody. Like I say, all brains dissociate, only in my case, it's more extreme. But I've always been very focused on the beauty of creating this Spanish speaker that's going to be his own person because he's going to go out there and experience life in Spanish, receive love in Spanish, and it's love that generates an identity. The moment someone loves you in Spanish, then you have an identity in Spanish. And I don't mean just romantic love, right? I mean any kind of love or appreciation, you know. So I think the whole, it it's so fluid um, even the concepts of what is your language and another and a second language when you learn a language so well, it's it's yours. You know, like this, I'm, I, I think that's another important element, right? There, there's this gray area, even with your own personal identity, which was especially important in the Cyprus Project workshops. I was always, you know, stressing for 
um, us to have a more Cypriot identity rather than a Greek Cypriot or Turkish Cypriot identity. The other thing about racism and xenophobia, I'm really sick of people being made to feel like awful people because xenophobia, i.e. a natural kind of fear towards unknown is natural it's something your brain is doing you shouldn't be made to feel like an awful person because of it you should be given solutions to it yeah that's not what they do it's you have to pretend your brain doesn't do that so imagine you grow up somewhere that is pretty homogenous and then suddenly you have a bunch of people from pakistan come it's entirely natural to have some xenophobia mm -hmm. now the thing is how do you deal with that? Because it's not a nice feeling. A brilliant way of dealing with that is learning some of the language of someone. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, if I feel xenophobia towards a, a, a people, the first thing I'd want to do is learn the language. So I had a certain xenophobia with Turks and Turkish Cypriots, which are very different things, but um, both equally, maybe more Turks even present in, in Northern Cyprus. You know, I grew up with a lot of indoctrination that I thought that, you know, I'd ignored, but actually it always goes deeper than what you think if you're looking for it. And um, that's partly why I made the Turkish course, isn't it? So yeah. And once you learn the language, it makes you want to be more involved in their culture. It may even make you want to go visit their culture and then it'll make them want to include you in more things it because becomes you speak their language. Of you. The moment you start move, moving your neurons to interpret the way it becomes of you, mm -hmm. again, this is something I might experience in quite an extreme way because of my neuro atypical situation. But it happens to everyone, and I know it because I've got that feedback. You know, I've gotten feedback from the Cypress Project workshops where people were like, all of you know, and they've written in very poetic ways to me explaining how all of this rejection and disgust flipped like it flipped on itself and it turned into warmness and mm. consumption even you mm. know like like wanting to consume more the language and it's amazing it's amazing so if people do have racism and xenophobia you need to treat it as something people need help for something that's natural it's a natural response of the brain because in all of our years of evolution, we've mostly been in homogeneous uh, situations, right? It's quite normal to experience some level of xenophobia. What's not normal and healthy is having to live with the consonant, the, the cognitive dissonance of blocking it out, uh, lest you be a terrible person, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so yeah, like, I think it's clear that and this is the point I think I most want to make all the time, and I'm always looking for the way to make it, is that the people who have charged themselves with resolving these very real problems of racism and xenophobia and prejudice, they're not there to solve it. Hmm. They're not there to solve it. You know, these are not the, these are not the steps you make to solve it. Making everybody extra sensitive where people feel like they can't even mention race because it's racist even to acknowledge it is not a way of sol solving anything it just generates more tensions more sensitivity and violence mm -hmm. you know, where they otherwise wouldn't be so uh, i just want to talk a little bit about the mechanics of the course because you mentioned earlier that you did greek 2.0 which means you threw away your first version and yeah. i'm sure there was some trial and error when you were developing this right and so what was the difference? What did you learn about applying the thinking method in a, or scaling it in a way that could help people where you're not in the room that you incorporate it in the second version and beyond? I think it was much more to do with content. I mean, as I, as I opened my mind more and more, as I became more confident that the truth wasn't what I was reading, the truth was what was in front of me. Um, and I really mean that grammatically, you know, you might read in a book that, you know, in Greek after na, you use X version of the verb. Okay, 90% of the time that's true, but only 90, why is that written there? That's not true. And, um, you know, just having to dig out new truths, find finding new truths. 
So that that was just, you know, there was a couple of courses I replaced in those first years where where I was really coming into my own, so to speak. And I want to I want to replace Spanish, to be honest now. Um, but I'm not I'm not going to like force it. Um, hopefully it's going to happen like live developing it slowly. But I'd, I'd love to make a because that was recording in 2014. Like I've had 10 years since then. <laughs> you well, you're know? doing a you're doing a, a 90 minute become fluent in yeah. Spanish. So that's that's like the precursor. So I'm doing no, it's not becoming fluent, of course. In <laughs> it, it's becoming basically conversational. Mm-hmm. So that means you can talk slowly, but it's just amazing what you can say after 90 minutes because there's we focus so much on the skill set of finding words you know through the patterns to find stuff to say stuff that you 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 didn't know you can say and also my weaving and all of this has gotten so much better so i can i can pack a lot more grammar into those 90 minutes where you can talk about past talk about adjectives like so much so much you can do uh so yeah that's my tightest writing like my tightest tightest writing i've ever done um but yeah i'd like to expand that into a new complete spanish at some point although my focus now is much more on on spreading the method you know, and trying to get new writers going, which is not going very well. Uh, mostly, you, you've Sorry. inadvertently started a community. I don't know if that was your intent when you first began this. Did, was that this, was that a happy side effect for you? Because you know, you 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 have multiple platforms. Your own your own social media. You have the website. You have the app. You have a lot of people commenting you're up in the comments as well you know and you've got you're developing relationships with people who are reaching out to you wanting to support you wanting to not write really you. i try not to <laughs> <laughs> so you're not intending to start a community but it's happening sort of no i mean people are always asking for that actually but communities are always quite unhealthy things so i don't want to start you know any official reddit groups all of that you know, um, even some people that come to defend me on the comments when people ask me, like, when is X coming out? <laughs> They've come on the comments, he's one person, leave him alone. <laughs> um, um, yeah. Now, also, it's a version of me, what you get through language transfer. No, you get the version of me that's entirely dedicated to you, but that's probably not who I want to be in everyday life. So you probably don't want to know me outside of language transfer like i'm probably going to ruin that illusion for you you know so um yeah i don't feel i feel very alone with the project i feel supported by a lot of people and i'm super appreciative of it but i i am very much working alone and and i don't tend to like yeah it's not been a source of relationships i'm hoping now that i've come back to the uk that uh, it will be because i I really need some like effective bonds in my life, especially after coming down the mountain after two years, you know? Mm-hmm. So you created it as a, as a, as a free app, but, but you accept donations. What have you learned about that model over these 10 or so years of offering it as a form of activism on a donation basis, what have you learned about people and human behavior when it comes to <laughs> supporting and donating? Um, a lot of things. I, I I noticed that the culture of donating increased a lot. Um, but I think people before would have, much more people would have felt like it was a completely like unchecked loss. You donate, no one knows, no one sees it, no one cares. But now I think there's much more culture around supporting. So so people enjoy it more um i would say that like you said a lot of people assume that if something's free then it must be rubbish um then there's when they realize it's not there's a lot of distrust a lot of people distrustful and they're like oh you're just making a plan to get rich do you not realize that if i charged a dollar for this i would be a millionaire already you know like what do you think what trick do you think i'm trying to do so you get a lot of irritating stuff like that but that's to be expected that shows you a lot about culture right that demonstrates a lot about culture but the most interesting thing and the thing i'd most like to share for others is that if you're an entrepreneur and you have you're working from love love for the world for life whatever you're going to do something great not for yourself 
not laugh for yourself and your supposed identity, but for everything outside, not that you shouldn't love yourself, um, then th it's a great time to ask for donations because I really feel like there's the bar is so low. Like there's so much depression, so many people just like looking to get by. There's so much bad culture of just uh, face value, you know, making pretty graphic designs, making things look like, you know, you know what it reminds me of actually? It reminds me of, <laughs> I used to work in this, this home for like children when I was in Buenos Aires, right? And I used to get this bus for this train for like 40 minutes out to, to this home, yeah? And people would get on the, the, chain and they'd be like this pen for sale with retractable pen nib and it's just a pen and it was just amazing like how somebody could go on for two minutes about pen <laughs> and then, oh man and you know argentines have the 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 reputation all over the spanish-speaking world of being like cham like the chamusho argentino which is like the the blah 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 the bullshitting you know and I was like, oh, this is a, a perfect and quite sad example of cham Chamusha Argentino, you know, like this lighter with electronic ignition and replaceable batteries. And blah, 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 blah. This is what I feel like is infected the whole of the Western world. No, look at my super organic, kale friendly project. And it's just like, hold on, but what's actually there? What is actually there? And a lot of the time, nothing other than self stroking of the ego so if you really do have something of value to give don't doubt yourself as much as i did just work on it love it and now is a good time if you want the freedom of living from donations and to share your project and you're much more motivated by your impact in the world rather than just like growing your bank balance or followers or what have you now is a brilliant time to be appreciated it wasn't when i started this but i really feel like now it is because people that are really compromised with the world in that way are forever rarer, sadly. Hmm. Well, you have 800 something supporters now, which it seems impressive to me through your Patreon. And uh, obviously we want other people who uh, engage with your app to- Especially also... now that I'm living in the, I've not asked for more money for ages, <laughs> for ages, because I haven't needed it. But now that I'm right. you know, living in a small village, but now that I'm in the UK, and I'm looking for a studio flat and they're going for 1,200 pounds. And yeah, so now if, if you do have some expendable income and you love this project, now is a good time to donate. I definitely need it now. I'm asking for more money again. Uh, if, if you think that I should be able to live in the country I grew up and not, not hidden in some Asturian mountain, then now's a nice time to donate. <laughs> I know if I ask you if you would do anything differently, what would you do? You probably would say no, but let's say you have to do one or two things differently. I would do everything. What would I'm you? Not someone, I'm not someone to regret the past, but okay. I, am aware, <laughs> I am aware of, oh, I would have done that differently if I was wiser. What would you do differently then? <sighs> Apologize so much less. Just be less apologetic in everything that I did. Mm. Uh, like asking, asking for help, whatever. And I wish I knew that it wasn't that common what I was doing. I never felt in any way that I was doing something special or unique. I thought it was a bit weird the way people would react. I still think it's a bit weird, to be honest. When people get it, like, oh, you are just doing this for free. It's not, this isn't a trick. And then they, they get soft and they soften in front of you. And I think it's strange, you know, um, because of the value system that I have. I wish I understood that when I was younger. Um, I would have been less confused by a lot of things and I would have I would have felt much better about asking for all of the help that I needed. Yeah, I guess that's what I would do differently. I'd just be more better self-esteem, I guess. I think people who are teachers and people who are thoughtful and people who are thoughtful teachers, we we tend to, I put myself in this category, but we tend to project that same level of thoughtfulness and things that are obvious to us onto other people. But I, I've, I've realized over the years, I've been teaching for decades now, that most people just, they're not as, if if they're not really teaching anything to anyone, they're not, you know how they say the teacher is the most interested person in the room. They're not really thinking in terms of the sort of nuanced concerns that that we are. 
And, uh, and that's been a revelation for me as well in, in that most people just, I, I don't think they're, they're malicious in their apathy towards a cause or, you know, a movement. Towards- this is something I've thought a lot about lately. There's a lot of people that just seem to have a total apathy towards life. And as I think more about the mechanics of life and how it might work, whether we're souls recycling or whatever, I do look and I just go, maybe the problem is expecting the same. And again, thinking about evil between commas, it's not my favorite word because it, it does feel a bit religious, but mm-hmm. a lot of people that do bad are just not really here. They're not comp- They're not present in life where they can understand the effects of their actions. And sometimes I wonder if all of these NPC folk, all of these non-player character folk uh, are just new souls. So I imagine... <laughs> new souls. I imagine, and I've seen in some deep meditations, like a big ball of energy which would be God or the universe or whatever. And it's just one consciousness dealing with two very important problems. Eternity, Mm -hmm. solitude, terrible combination. I've done it just for a couple of years. (laughs) And you know, so solitude and eternity are terrible problems. And this big ball of vibration, bits of it separate off and they go into the world to develop. And the point of that is to accompany this big ball. And sometimes I look around and I see the way people behave and I see the little impetu, impetus that they have sometimes to do the right thing and to push through with what's correct and not be a hypocrite, not do what they would criticise in somebody else and how little all of that actually happens. And sometimes I wonder if it's just like most souls live one life and go right back to the hole. Like they live one life and they go, oh, God, that was horrible. Put me back to God. And... Then there's others that are able to exist, and I love this word, exist, which just means standing out of the whole, ex, out, cyst, to stand, that manage to exist for longer, for many lives, and develop and become forever more complicated. And I wonder sometimes if that's the case, and if, and I wonder, like, what am I? Am I new so on some heavy, fast-track learning? Have I been here before and I need to just, like, get over all of this internalized self-hatred i've grown up with so i can take those reins and do the good that i feel like i need to do in the world rather than constantly feeling so small um but i have a lot of these spiritual questions not that i'm decided on any of it they are questions but they really do feed into like my outlook and and my motivation so yeah that's a possibility maybe most souls just live one life that would explain a lot of the mess that's going on <laughs> Well, I would even argue that you're on a spiritual mission, right? Meaning, I think the questions themselves are what we want to start asking more of. We may not have the answer. We may, you know, kind of like how Rilke says, like we we ultimately will live into the answer, but don't search for the answer right now, but just love the questions themselves. Yeah. And that's, that's what I get from language transfer in addition to learning, obviously. I love every single, so yeah, there's people that really, and I was, I remember very distinctly being like this when I was younger and how scared uncertainty would make me feel. There's people that need truths to hold on to in life. I was one of those people. And there's people that every single time a new rational doubt appears, they feel rejuvenated and excited about life. I became one of those people. So I became one of those people. So when I started to doubt, like for me, it was just like, you know, you're born, you die and that's it. And when I started to doubt it, because I always, I never used to think about this. And I used to say, if it was any other way, if we were meant to know how this works, it would be obvious. That's how I used to say. So when people ask me about God and all of that, which happened a lot living in the Middle East, I just be like, look, if we were meant to know, it'd be obvious. Just have fun. And then at some point I started to go, oh shit, I think it's obvious. I think it is obvious. And I started to look in a practical, rational way. So I like to tell people, this is actually on my Tinder profile, (laughs) that I'm rationally spiritual, right? Which is a weird combination, but I am extremely rationally spiritual. I'm always thinking about the mechanics of a tamba, which is a, a vibration, which is what I believe the soul is and why we say person per sound and how it would work reincarnation and what is a person 
being the combination of a timbre of frequency and the body that channels it and the nervous system that channels it. Like I think a lot about this in 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 a way that like you say everything motivates me in life when it feeds back into that one big question and that's what i feel like we're severely lacking in the western world we abandoned the big question we abandoned the idea of spirituality and we replaced it with like psychology which literally just means soulology in greek psyche soul all of us uh you know so we're just too embarrassed to even say it <laughs> and that was a natural step for a society to take that wasn't going to be unified in the same religion. But the big mistake for me was completely ignoring the spiritual question. It should be there. We shouldn't be fighting over the answers. Please, God, we should not be fighting over the answers. We should be just very excited about what the possible answers might be. You know, so personally, I think reincarnation is the most likely thing, but I don't think every soul, like I say, comes back. I think that uh, certain timbers will put up with existence and life that is necessarily painful. I think most will survive it and go back to what we call God. That's just an idea. I don't know if that's true. I'm still open-minded. I'm still, you know, but the fact is it is mad. It is mad that we're here. It is mad, the consciousness that we have. And we shouldn't be shying away from that. And I believe that the depression that is weakening the Western the Western world to such a state where we can be so spiritually corrupt to the point where we generate homophobia with anti-homophobia and we generate racism with anti-racism and we generate misogyny and all of the rest, you know, by supposedly wanting to do the opposite. <laughs> Well, I want to offer, I don't disagree with what you're saying, but I do want to offer a, a more sort of, I, I guess you'd say optimistic twist on it <laughs> in that we've come such a long way in the last, you know, few thousands of years where that's all there was, was people getting stoned. We came, we came a very long way in the last 50 years, mm -hmm. but the point is that it's deliberately being turned back. You know, and I, I can't tell you who's doing that. I, I don't think it's it was an idea. Well, I think it's all quite clear, really. I know this might sound like conspiracy people. Like It's very funny how certain things are like easily put into conspiracy theory realm, even when they're on the news. So <laughs> we already know that our major cultural actors and political actors are in a great majority of cases compromised by things like epstein island and recordings and whatever so we might assume that all of this crazy stuff in the western world is not actually coming from us maybe it's coming from whoever put all of those compromised people there oh, i wish this could this sense could come together quicker in people's minds jesus i follow this football team this american college football team and um and they've been literally the premier team every year for the last like 15 or something years and this year they got a new coach and they're horrible. They're not that great. And I listened to a commentator because I read all the commentaries after every game that they lose. <laughs> and he said, the problem is you, your the fan base is still expecting them to be this excellent team having the occasional average game. And he says, what it actually is, is they're now an average team having the occasional excellent game. And I think humans are the same way. When we find ourselves sort of disappointed with how we behave and how we treat each other and the human condition overall, I think the adjustment could be made in our expectations around what what we are, what we're concerned about, what we're motivated by. And um, and Chris Voss, the, the hostage negotiator who's you know does all the podcasts, he says, look. When you think people are doing something to you, that's not really what's happening. People aren't really against you. They're just for themselves. And now with social media and internet and hyper-connectivity, we are more sort of selfish and we're more solipsistic. Especially I don't agree with that. I, I, th there is definitely a concerted effort to make people against other people rather than just for themselves. I mean, like you have literally Antifa, anti fascist Right? I'm not a fan of fascists, but their decision about who is and who isn't a fascist is not very balanced. I'm a fascist for stuff I've said today. And that's deliberate because those people are getting deliberately empowered. There's a deliberate effort 
to divide and we need to be wiser than it we need to rise above it you know there's not much else we can do um i don't think it's not optimistic it does motivate me it motivates me to work and that's optimistic if it was all perfect i wouldn't be bothered you know and and after having you know being quite damaged by the way people treated me in all of these different like in occupy buffer zone in cyprus or any ambience i was in where i wasn't just repeating the party line i was always thinking for myself and giving nuanced opinions the way you get treated in that context uh, that it's not natural it's people have been really brainwashed people have been really brainwashed uh to hate and it's the ones that are always going on about anti-hate and it is it's 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 the biggest problem right now that i can see it's so 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 dangerous i don't think it's an accident i feel like it's planned i feel very sorry for the young people that have been indoctrinated by that it's not nice to grow up feeling that the world is how they've taught you it is and every single thing is like a you know every kind of uh, how do they call it micro microaggression <laughs> mm -hmm. but don't you think a lot of these are driven by like even with antifa it's driven by the the desire for publicity like let's say they were operating in a vacuum and no one ever knew what they were doing they would lose the desire to do it so that's what i mean by the no, i don't think so. of seeing the effects on social media on the news that's what that's what i think that's what they're really craving not in my experience. I mean, I've. I mean, that's certainly a that's certainly a thing for a lot of people. But at least my experience in like uh, Cyprus and Greece and whatever, it's much more about their in group. It's how they click within their in group. You know, um, a lot of them are quite anti internet and all of that, and getting you know, and having their image online and whatever. It's just. Um, but it's perpetuated by the echo chamber. Like if you're if you're mainlining yeah. this constant feed of validation to your perspective for eight nine hours a day you're going to think everybody thinks like this so sure it makes it depends it depends because if if part of that perspective is that you adopt the identity you're being against then necessarily built into that identity it's not that everybody thinks like you so again if you're antifa if you're anti-racist like i think anti-racist are some of the worst because they they will oblige you to to agree with stuff that for me is racist but they say if you're not anti-racist you're racist i'm like yeah but dude the stuff you've written in your anti-racist manifesto you're too ignorant and unnuanced to understand how racist that is mm -hmm. and also 20 years younger than me so shut up <laughs> um, but you know like i understand how they feel i get it i understand that they a lot of them are just really good people that have been indoctrinated and again going back to argentina Oh, this is such a heavy thing to talk about because I, I kind of, when I arrived at Argentina, I adopted a lot of the trauma from the dirty war, which was late seventies, early eighties. But I was living with artists that had to run like to the Amazon when that was going on. And they were painting about, you know, their friends were disappearing, like um, 30,000 people supposedly got disappeared by the government, you know, and um, that that's where I worry that this is going to end up that's what i worry because you can have good people that indoctrinate you to such an extent that they can do terrible terrible things that they believe is for the greater good and i never had that consideration about the argentina history i was like oh was it like it is now back then is that why it went that far because especially when you get to like very controversial stuff um I don't know, like interfering in the gender of a child, then you can see the um, the potential for violence where people cannot see eye to eye. And I wondered, oh, is this something else that has already happened in Argentina? Are we going to end up in the West with a dirty war situation? You have 10 courses, languages, again, French, Swahili, Italian, Greek, German, Turkish, Arabic, Spanish. And you also have a music course and it sounds like you're going to be having a philosophy course or a psychology <laughs> course at some point soon, maybe something, a spirituality course. Something or other. It's all using the principles of the thinking method, which I found to be the most effective m w means of learning a language. And um, and you're also, you have a book called The Thinking Method, which people can donate or they can download for free and they can create their own courses. 
and contribute to this body of knowledge. And so it's really impressive what you're doing, Mahalis. And I thank I, you. I'm glad we got a chance to go a little deeper into your story. And I I promise right now that I'm going to bring you back on so that we can just talk more about the other stuff because cool. I think that's important to 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 have as an extension of the uh, the platform to, to get that documented as well. So thank you very much, my friend. Well, thank you, Light. This has been fun. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.